Welcome, Awakening Hearts. Denny Van here. I am your host of Heartfelt Awakening. Today, we are talking with Dr. Marsha Martin. Hey, Marsha. Welcome. How are you? I'm wonderful. Thank you so much for having me here today, Denny. So let me tell, tell them about you. You're a spiritual empowerment counselor. Tell us more about that. My role is to help you overcome whatever fears and limitations may be keeping you in a place that you don't enjoy, a place that feels stuck or uncomfortable or is related to past pain and trauma. And so I help you understand, first of all, how you got there and then why you may... feel still as though you need to be there. And then lovingly, we look at it and let it go. Because it is just so important that we stop engaging with whatever past pain and trauma we may have had, we must stop engaging with it from the place of criticism, or blame or shame, or any kind of judgment. We just have to take a look, oh, I see what it is, then, oh, I see how from where I was, why that would have felt necessary or attractive or uh, the only choice. And then we get to decide, am I ready to let it go? Or do I need to explore this even further? And then we must remember, there are no right answers. If you need to explore being in that pain for longer, that's okay. It is okay. I love what you said about you get to decide. So what made you decide to become a an empowerment counselor? What was your journey that got you to this point? So much pain and struggle. <laughs> you know, um, believing that I had no power believing that no matter how much good I try to put in the world, it could never make a dent. And so I was just going to live my life, giving and receiving pain in return. And how did you undo believing that I had no power? How did you undo that to step into what your role is today? It was not a, oh, wow, look what I can do. It was very long, dark, and painful because I didn't have any tools. So, you know, I would stumble up upon one idea and I would think, this is the answer. And I would run after that for a while. And I would then maybe six months or a year down the road, I would think, oh, nothing has changed. Well, this must not be true. Or, oh, it's so painful that this isn't what I wanted. I wanted a solution and I'm getting bits and pieces. But what was wonderful that was happening is that all these bits and pieces were adding up to something. So as I gathered all these bits and pieces and tried these different ways, I was also changing my belief system. I didn't yet know how to release pain, but I was starting to look at my life differently. I was starting to believe miracles were possible immediately in this day that we are in, as opposed to something that happened forever ago and was no longer practical or probable. So I began just really getting a new, broader understanding, and that made more room for information to come in. I hadn't put it all together because I was still motivated mostly by the pain and the loss and the failures of the past, but I was getting this incredible education in all of these things that were possible. And so what became that last leg was just opening so much that then I am able to work directly with the energetic realm. And they showed me, you don't need to carry this. 
This was your choice. We can help you release it if you're ready, but you that. don't have to carry it. I love that. And I love what you talked about. There were bits and pieces. So you take a little bit of this, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and you create something of your own, right? So yes, are you a licensed therapist? I No, I'm a pastoral counselor. Okay. So I look at things from the energetic perspective, as opposed to, which is interesting because I began my earlier career in educational and developmental psychology. It was the brain, the brain, you know, if I can just understand how you're thinking, I can teach you in a way that you will understand. And I had to leave the brain behind and go here and connect with the divine and all of that wisdom and support in order to really step into my authenticity. Because while the brain was in charge, I was so vulnerable to whatever the ego decided we were going to go after that day. You know, it was sort of like, well, you failed so many times, so we're just going to sort of wear this failure badge. And your job now in life is to make sure that no one around you fails. So you'll have to work 24 hours a day to make sure that they are not put in this position. This is what you deserve because you failed so often. So now you have to do penance to make sure that others don't do what you have done. And it was just grinding away at my being. So it is such a relief to go into the heart and just say, oh, what would you have me do this day? How can I do it for the highest good of all? And thank you for all the support because I know I'm not doing this alone. Absolutely. Yes, the path of the brain. I too was on a counseling traditional you know, a uh, path of licensed counseling and going down that path. And I just, I just couldn't do it in, and also with 30 years of being a minister and teaching um, this path of the brain is, is the wrong path. <laughs> it's the heart. It's definitely the heart. So in reading in your bio, um, you talk a little bit about your healing approach and being angel heart healing technique. Tell us about that. This is what they gifted to me. I had really just gone to the end of my ability to function. You know, it was just like, okay, I'm at the end of the road. I have done everything my brain has told me is smart to do in order to move forward. And I am sliding steadily backward. And now I just fell off the cliff. So, you know, I'm kind of out of ideas, kind of out of uh, where to go next. And I really love to read. So what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to go to the library because the finances are gone. I go to the library and just haunt the religion and spirituality section of every branch of every library that is anywhere near me until I understand because all I can figure out is there is something more and I am not able to understand it or interact with it in a way that's helpful enough for me to move from here to here. And so that was began my reading journey of exploration of, you know, just getting to the place where well, they did it, I can do it, you know, because it was consuming enough information so that I would stop saying, don't come in here. I don't deserve you. It, it just kind of wore away at that um, no entry point until I didn't even realize how much I was absorbing, just reading other people's accounts, looking at the way they did it. And I read everything, every different kind of approach. And it just all kind of, you know, filtered in there until I was able to remember who I was and what I had brought to share. And so 
one of the things that I discarded very early on is my ability to talk with the angelic realm. So, you know, the thing that I did normally as a child for hours and hours and upon hours walking in the woods and playing by the stream and and having these wonderful little conversations of just fun with this energy that I would have just assumed was myself, uh, all of that had gotten cast away, picked it back up in high school, wanted to be normal for college, so put it away again, went to my master's program, found other people that were into the paranormal, and spent my master's program meditating and doing healing rooms and going, you know, finding every program that I could. But then again, huh, you know, that was fun. But I need a real job. You know, I can't keep doing this crazy stuff. Or I'm never going to be able to eat. So threw it away again and just went on the deep dive into absolute um oblivion, the oblivion of my being. And so it took going that far away from what I knew and loved so dearly to bring me the commitment to go all the way back <laughs> to the to home and to stay there. But of course, when I finally said, oh, wait a minute, I can talk with you all. I remember this. I, I call it writings because I, at the time, and still do, I would write what they say because I find I don't often remember it and I need to go back and uh, review it again and again and again because there's different layers of it depending on how expanded you are. And so I'd write it down and I, I was just amazed that all of this help had been waiting here for me all this time. <laughs> and I had gone on this journey down to the depths of despair. But they showed me how to meet the energy of the Christ consciousness in the heart. And then with the help of other angelic beings who would be specific to whatever we were working on, we would go and then... First, look carefully at what this belief is, or this fear, or this whatever you've created. Look at it so that you can feel totally satisfied that you are releasing it, and you've gotten everything out of it that you could possibly want. So it's not, I'm afraid. I'm not going to look because I, I just, you know, somebody stopped me from being afraid. I don't want to look at it because it's scary. You go with all of this loving support to look at this fear, why it was created, what it meant to you, what it did for you, and how it is now hindering you. And then from there, are you ready to release it? Okay. But it's never just... I have this big fear. Angels take it away. Well, that's not <laughs> that doesn't give you any kind of satisfaction. I have this big fear. Let's go see why I would have created this. What did I think it was doing? It was always created to serve a purpose in the beginning. And then it gets distorted as we don't look at it until it becomes a huge limitation. Yep. Distorted. And I find, yes. yeah, I find most of these things are created in childhood as a reaction or a misunderstanding to events that are happening or that have happened to the this individual. Communication for sure. Yes. Yes. Because uh, you, you talked about uh, a little bit of communication and you went to the library and just read everything. What would be like the top two or three books that really sparked that heart-centered opening? Wait, you know, my doctorate also required a tremendous amount of reading. So I'm going to use those books, which are much more recent in my brain, <laughs> because 
those I read so many authors that were emerging in the late 1800s when they were just kind of stepping into this understanding. And these authors are particularly valuable because they are hardcore. They were not in this, you know, new age kind of fluffy thing. They are hardcore. So if they are telling you, put God to the test, they mean you must not waver. So it was H. Emily Cady. She has a whole Lessons in Truth, amazing um, science of mind, Ernest Holmes. Again, I mean, they pound it into you that you must align with the divine and stay in that place. They bring in, especially Ernest Holmes, brings in scientific thought to prove his point about the goodness of God, the fact that God is loving, that God is not punishing you, that if you are experiencing punishment, it is because of prior choices and you are not being punished, you are merely experiencing the result of the choice, you are interacting with your consequence, but it is not that God could punish you. And then those two, and and also Florence Shin is another wonderful one. Florence Scovel Shin, she wrote, and they expanded it out into a trilogy, but the one that is the most magnificent of hers is The Game of Life and How to Play It. And she, again, they do not play. They say, okay, you're going to put God to the test. This is what you're going to do, and you will not waver. I didn't realize how robbery I was until I spent time with all of them and then had to explain in my dissertation why it was possible to walk steadfastly with the divine and how that would bring you every kind of joyous experience that you could ever desire. So I did a compare and contrast of Maslow's hierarchy as opposed to the life of Jesus, that Christ energy flowing through you supersedes the need for Maslow's hierarchy. And as a psychologist, I lived, ate, and breathed Maslow's hierarchy. Everybody has to progress this way, and you can't do it top down. You have to do it this way. And then I studied the life of, the, of Jesus as the Christ, and I'm like, Hey, wait a minute. You just do. You lived, ate, and breathed this. You knew that you had access to everything that you could desire, and your life mirrored it perfectly. You didn't spend any time in doubt or fear or blame or what if? Oh, I'm, oh, I'm scared. There was just, hey, I don't want to do this, came out of his mouth. And I, <laughs> but there was never, it's not going to work. I, I, I'm scared that something's going to go wrong. It was just, hey, choose your course, make sure that it's aligned with the divine and do not waver and you will get to your goal. So those 18, late 1800s, New thought leaders who, in the film wars too, they were good. Um, they just were a tougher breed of people. And they're going to make you toe that line. And that's what we have to do. We, there are times when we just can't be all over the place and get results. Actually, that's always <laughs> correcting me. You cannot be in six places and continue moving steadily ahead. Pick one, make sure you, it is aligned with your greatest good, and just go until you are directed in the onto the next road. You don't need to change direction. Design. Yes, stay in that place. And there is never going to be a time when you say, is this right for me? 
and there is no kind of answering synchronistic event, word, sign. If you are not getting the answer, you're not being a very good listener. And that it, that hurt my heart to hear that one too, because I didn't. <laughs> darn that responsibility! Those were not my distractions, <laughs> right? All those distractions. Yeah. Oh, that shiny object. Don't forget that spiritual stuff I'm supposed to do. Oh yeah, so that stuff. Done. You know, I gotta get a real job. I'm like, oh Lord, help me. I loved what you said about remembering who I am. And this is the awakening heart. So for listeners, awakening hearts listening, what message would you have for them? The deepest message that they taught me is when you heal your heart, you will transform your life. You will let go of whatever it is that was challenging you in your life to the point that you gave up you. When you heal this, all of you has an opportunity to emerge. So it is always go within, align with the divine. Don't just go in, go into the heart space and try to bring your judgment and your criticism. Go into the heart space and allow that energy that is there, which is only unconditional love and acceptance, allow that energy to love you and fill you and guide you. You're not going to be able to carry your heavy baggage with you. So don't expect that you're going to come out the same way that you went in. So true. <laughs> you have to go through. <laughs> exactly. Yes. And, you know, let's remember too, purification is huge, but it is not ego purification. It is not... You're a dirty, filthy sinner, so you're no good. It is the opportunity to be released from all of the shame and the blame and the guilt and the fear and that just nonsense that we assign to ourselves. So, yes, you will emerge a pure, lighter, grander being than you went in. But it is not that God made you something you are not. It is you are accepting who you are, and then you are opening to become even more. So let's remember that every single person comes in with greatness. Greatness is inherent in every being. Everyone has a life purpose. Everyone has brought a specific uh, challenge, but also a specific gift. And so when you allow yourself to go into the heart, it is brushing off the dust first, the cobwebs, getting away all of that stuff. And then you are going to get to t spend time experimenting with your gift. How far can you go with this? You're unlimited. It's up to you. What do you want to do with this gift? How can you make it impactful? What all can you give? And um, expect that there will be challenges because the challenge is going to help you define your gift even further. It helps you understand who you are and ways in which you are limiting yourself. So it is the all-in-one journey. It's the get everything done in one place. You don't have to go anywhere else. About, um, the gift and that the challenge helps uncover that gift. And uh, without the challenge, you know, why would we have to search for something, you know? And in that searching, like the game, you know, you're playing the game and all of a sudden you get these special powers, you know, you get the gift after going through. So speaking of gifts, you have an offer for our listeners. You want to tell us about that? Sure thing. On my website, we are giving away an ebook. It's 11 ways in which we resist angelic assistance. And I find it so fascinating. The more work that I do on myself in the heart, you would think by now I would have no resistance. There are still ways that 
we put up artificial barriers between ourselves and these this incredible help. So this book just will remind you, here are some things to be on the alert for, and then it will give you a little guide of what you can do instead. You know, instead of holding on to perhaps your familial or societal or even cultural belief system, just because that's what you've always known, maybe take a minute to see if it registers well with you. And I uh, find so often people will come to me and say, well, you know, this is the way it has to be. And there is no has to be. There is only highest good. So it's okay for you not to do as it has been done before. We are all here, especially those of us who are early awakeners, we are all here as way showers and not as followers. Love that. So where can people find you? Please visit my website. It's mmhearthealer.com. And there you will have so many resources and ways that you can interact with myself and all the angels. Excellent. Thank you so much. And Awakening Hearts, thank you so much for listening in. Do be sure to remember, subscribe, like, and share. And let me know in the comments what you loved. And let me know what you would love more of. And in the meantime, keep being amazing. Thank you.